Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Legion Patreon episode of the Friday Nightmares podcast. I am one third of your hosting team this evening, Mr. Smoke Show Crawford, coming to you from the town of Swartz Creek in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. I'm fully vaxxed, waxed, and ready to climax, and if you can please get me wet and feed me after midnight. (laughs) And with Scott (laughs) is Heather Powell coming to you from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. But more importantly, as with all these top five episodes, we have a very special guest with us. Um, This gentleman has, I think, is a pioneer in the podcasting community. He he is is. a strong voice on Fresh Cuts. He is also on No More Room in Hell. He's also on Theme Warriors. And I believe, I can't remember the one that he does for the Freddy's Nightmare series, Um, but I'll get him to, you know. Burning for Springwood. Oh, Burning for Springwood. Right, Burning for Springwood. Um, He is probably one of the most intelligent, kind, welcoming podcasters that I've had a privilege of of working with. Uh, Back when I first got into podcasting, he added me right away to the Fresh Cuts chat group, which is extremely popular among our podcasting friends. Uh, He's he's really funny and he rolls with jokes really well. And he is Mr. Mike Merriman. Mike, thank you for joining us. Hey, what's up? I don't know what was better, like that intro of me or Scott's like ever increasingly long uh, (laughs) intro of himself. Like those two intros are battling each other. (laughs) Right? Like, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm Heather. I'm from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. Like there's nothing fucking special. Um, So Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, With all of our special guests, we always ask for a little bit of background of how they got into liking horror movies and then how they got into podcasting. So if you don't mind sharing a little bit about you. All right. So I guess we'll start with the how I got into horror period um i well i uh, i'll start off by saying i was kind of fortunate to live in a household that was pretty open to content consumption in all forms obviously you know it's not everything goes but for my age i remember just kind of being allowed to watch whatever i had a tv in my bedroom from a young age now obviously I feel so old now. When I was a kid, it's not like you had a hundred channels to choose from. It was like your five local networks. But um, one of my earliest memories was my dad taking me to the drive-in. We were big drive-in family back then. And um, Batman 89 was playing with Child's Play. And I think he half expected that, uh, you know, being like uh, eight, about eight or nine at the time, he probably have expected me to fall asleep somewhere during Batman and sleep through child's play. But the, uh, what happened was the, the beginning part of that plan worked, except I woke up not realizing we were into child's play and suddenly a babysitter <laughs> gets thrown out the, the skyscraper window. So I was like, huh, what is it? And I found out shortly after, no longer Batman on the screen. Batman um, through the babysitter. <laughs> yeah, and I think it was that, and he showed me like a scene from Dream Warriors because it just happened to be on TV at the time. And it was one of those things where being a kid, you were definitely scared, but it also kind of gave you that excitement and the anxiety that ever since I've been chasing when I watch horror movies, you know? So... It was just, it was bored out pretty quick just from watching movies as a kid and, and like I said I think it helped being uh, raised in a family that was pretty open to it like I'm not you were watching Solo and Serbian so, film uh, yeah. at a young age <laughs> yeah that, that's what I did like you my watched Serbian uh, film before senior project on yeah that's Solo <laughs> Solo was your senior project right. Yeah, I, I feel bad for all of the, the, like, you hear a lot from podcasters, like, oh, I wasn't even allowed to watch horror movies until I was 16, or so. I was like, oh, man, that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I, I was young when I started watching them, just like you. Mm-hmm. I, I think I remember, too, my parents watching uh, Tales from the Crypt when it was on HBO, mm-hmm. like, originally yep. airing, and I would kind of, like, watch but not watch, you know, kind of over their shoulders, or I'd be in the kitchen quote unquote getting some food and just kind of standing there watching the tv screen and fascinated by that at the time because i was too young to even really know about the ec comics and uh yeah so those kind of things started me out on the journey and then as far as podcasting itself goes we're looking 
God, I think officially my first show was 2008 and it was called Evil Episodes Podcast. Uh, went through a different, a few different versions with co-hosts, but basically it was to do horror TV. That was the focus on it. And um, the reason I was interested in that at the time was A, because when I kind of grew up in the mid, late, early 90s, or excuse me, mid, late 80s into early 90s, there was kind of like a horror TV renaissance at that time as a kid with like Tales from the Dark Side, Monsters, Tales from the Crypt, um, and all the other like, you know, lower budget shows. So, you know, then it kind of went away for a while, not 100%, but then in the late 2000s, you know, you had Dexter, uh, Walking Dead was just getting started, um, and American Horror Story was just getting started. So I I was hearing all, uh, more horror podcasts at the time that just weren't even covering the shows uh, other than in passing, like acknowledging that they're out there, but not really getting into it. So I was like, hey, maybe this would be a good idea to cover. And that went for six years, maybe about wow. 140 episodes. Wow. And what what kind of brought that show to the end was just me eventually, you know, I, with kids, it was hard to keep up on TV yeah. shows. And once you get behind, when you're covering multiple TV shows, once you get behind and it's like, oh, I need to watch like three episodes of five shows. It's like, couldn't keep up. And to me, that type of show, specifically when you're covering TV, it's just not as topical unless you're on top of it every week. Right. Um, and you were too busy just, watching other shows with your kids. Oh, Dora yeah, of Or whatever that Peppa shit Pig. Was. Oh, Peppa <laughs> yeah. Pig, which has its own horror theme apparently on the internet. But yeah, not, yeah, not the show yeah. that you needed to be watching. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, that's kind of the history for me. And uh, it when that went away, I was like, well, I don't want to stop podcasting totally. So started up like No More Woman Hell, where it was more we just pick what we want to watch and do all that kind of stuff so that's where we are today well where did fresh cuts come from like how did you come up with that so fresh cuts and i don't know how much you guys might already i forget who knows what so fresh cuts was kind of an evolution from uh something on evil so evil episodes because it was mostly tv horror and stuff well we would try to incorporate uh when we would watch new movies on it but it just was a weird kind of fit because like you can mm. do its own separate segment. So I created like a sidecast called Just the Movies because it was like- Oh, well, I've heard of that. Right, yeah. exactly. So then somewhere in the life of Just the Movies, I brought Venom on um, as like the co-host of that. But then when we stopped Evil Episodes, I was kind of talking to him on the side and it was like, it didn't make sense to call it Just the Movies anymore because it's like, well, if it, this is Just the Movies and what else, like, you know, there's no, no companion to it. Yeah. So then we changed it to Fresh Cuts and which made more sense given the context of everything going on. And then it paired with No More When Hell, it made sense. So that's where Fresh Cuts came from. Um, and it's it's been like pretty consistent. Like, I think we I think we take off like a week or two at the end of the year when we're trying to put together the top 10 list because that's when we're doing all our catch-up watches of what did we miss from this year but other than that it's pretty much every week which I'm actually pretty I'm pretty like impressed with like when I go to look at the because I save all the a copy of all the files and when I go to the folder to see I was like wow we really did do this every single week this year well, I got to tell you, Mike, when I first started listening to horror podcasts, so I first found Kill the Cast, and then I found Fresh mm -hmm. Cuts, and I was like, oh my God, Venom and Mike are so cool. They know so much. Like, I, I was religious with those downloads. The moment you dropped a new episode, I was listening to it. And then when you added me to the Fresh Cuts chat, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to say Chad is Mike and Venom. Oh my God, they're so cool. Oh my God, I'm such a loser. Like and The funny thing is, uh, sorry, Heather, to interrupt, but- uh, No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, the funny thing is, because uh, you and I were just starting to talk about our podcast at that point. And- uh, Oh, I was listening to Fresh Cuts a year before I met Well, no, no, I'm just saying when you got added to the chat. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And then I was like, oh, I didn't get added to the chat. What oh, the yeah, hell? Right. And then, <laughs> then you ended up and added me a little bit later, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, poor Scott. He didn't realize that he wasn't as cool as me. Um, still doesn't. That's why we have a fucking eight-hour intro that he needs to do. I got but, a uh, self-esteem boost. 
<laughs> but honestly, Mike, you've always been so welcoming from the beginning. I feel like in our little podcasting, a former horophilia, now um, dark discussion slash legion, like you're the welcoming guy. You're the yeah. guy where you go to a party who goes, hey, you want a drink? Hey, you want a toke? Like you're that guy. You're that guy that shows everyone where to put their jacket and introduce <laughs> them to people because you were just so welcoming. And I hope you never change that about yourself, especially for new podcasters. And you always give people a chance on Fresh Cuts. Um, that's where I cut my teeth, you know, going on fresh cuts and some, uh, commentaries that I've done with nudie on NFW and it's not horror. And of course going on with killed the cast, if it wasn't for that experience, I probably wouldn't have had any confidence to start my own. So thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of, that's what, what my vision. So originally when it was just me and Venom, it was kind of my vision, like, you know, just, uh, me and Venom will co-host and we'll just bring on different people every week, whether it's like new people I meet or people I've known forever, especially, you know, the pandemic kind of messed with everything because we had to obviously go to VOD stuff where not everyone might have seen what we watched. But the first few years when it was like pretty much theatrical stuff all the time, I, I just thought it was a good outlet to get different people on because these are the movies most people are going to see, period, like mm-hmm. across the board, regardless of like everyone's personal taste in movies most horror fans want to go to the theater to see whatever is new and then give it a chance so i was like okay here's a good opportunity to get people on like it's a movie everyone's gonna see i'm not asking anyone to track down something crazy and everyone knows when movies come out there it's almost like you don't need an expert it's like hey movie comes out here we're recording here if you can make it cool if not we'll get you next time like all easy and smooth well even for your top 10 shows too like if someone doesn't know like doesn't have their own show or for some reason they just want to do a top 10 they know they can go on fresh cuts and I think that's Mm -hmm. a really it it speaks to who you are as a person so you know I think it's awesome that you can join us and awesome for everything that you've done for the community I'm like Heather if you're trying to get on this year's top 10 show just ask oh my god (laughs) We do awards and I don't, Scott and I always think that's a good idea. We're always like, well, we've done our one award show. Like, let's fucking hold our shit here. Right. But like, (laughs) you know, we're always like, yeah, yeah, we'll do, we'll do awards. Cause I like other people's top 10, but I find that sometimes the top tens are repetitive. And Mm -hmm. then you go on a top 10 show with too many people. Everyone's just saying the same movie over and over again. And then trying to say something different about the movie. Um, So I prefer listening than I do going on. Uh, but I appreciate the invite. I know that I could get on any time, Mike. Like, let's be real. You and oh, I would be. Look, look at her ego. Well, you know, I'm kind of important. I'm, I'm, I'm in kind a of couple a of chat team. groups with Mike now. And it's, it's, it sounds like we have some student has become the master type. That's thing. right. That is exactly what has happened. I run this community for sure. <laughs> yeah. All, all things considered, I'm thinking like, this year could be interesting with top tens only because of so much VOD. Like we yes. did, yeah. we we did start getting obviously the theaters open again, but I still think there's a lot out there that, that wasn't in theaters. And like so many people I've seen talk about movies I haven't even seen, and I just start adding it to this never ending list of things I need to see. Same. Before your end watch of the year. list, your watch list, mm-hmm. it ends up being like fifty fucking movies, and then you're like, oh fuck my life. Okay, what looks interesting? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, right. that used to just happen on Netflix, but now it's like every app. I'm like, oh, I got 20 on this app. I need to watch 10 over here, five. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so true. Hashtag, hashtag horror now, which is the way we want it to be. Thank God we have access to more international films. Thank God Shutter has great access. Netflix for international films. Prime even sometimes you can get some good shit on Prime. You know, thank God we have it. Mm-hmm. Thank God we have the variety. But uh, thanks for being here, Mike. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Scotty and Scotty can introduce our our topic for this top five, I think we've already said it, but not Scotty can say it again and uh, we'll get started. All right. So yeah, I just want to say thank you for joining us, Mike. Cause yeah, you have, like Heather said, you are super welcoming. You are the welcome committee when it comes to podcasting and yeah, you have always been just like, so offering and uh, offered me to join your show multiple times. I think I, and I did the top 10 of you guys last year, which was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so we will get into our top five list and our top five list is basically our top five Halloween watches. This is our own personal choice on like movies that we have a tradition with watching around this time of year. Um, so each week it could be, you know, exactly Halloween themed or it couldn't, it's just whatever we feel. It could be Halloween one to five. Yeah. Or it could just be like movies not related to Halloween at all. Yes. (laughs) We don't give a shit. There's no rules here on Friday Nightmare. We run our own rules. Yeah, we we run Barter Town. That's right. That, that's, as uh, as course, Psyops would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. 
All right, so I will get to uh, our number five. So my number five is a childhood favorite that I grew up pretty much throughout the age of like seven and up. Still watch the hell out of his movies. And I have to go with 1991's Ernest Scared Stupid. I knew it was coming. I fucking love this movie to death. It is, I've, I'm a, for one, to all the listeners, I am a huge Ernest fan. I own all of his movies. I watch them pretty regularly, probably at least once a year. I'll go through like the entire Ernest series and Ernest Scared Stupid is always uh, one of my first go-to Halloween themed watches because I just love the special makeup effects for the trolls done by the Chiodo brothers who have done like Critters and uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And plus, it's just earnest, so it's just corny and silly and fun. And it's just a great film to introduce to, like, someone that's not a big fan of horror, but has elements of horror. Because there are certain scenes in this movie that are pretty damn creepy, especially with the troll when he gets, like, his full powers, like, during the last third of the movie. Like, it's, yeah, I just love this film, and we'll talk about it nonstop all the time. I and I have to say, uh, Cut to the Chase is actually going to be doing an episode on it. And I was so bummed my name did not get pulled for the Ernest Scared Stupid movie. <laughs> it did get pulled for Beetlejuice, though. So. I did, which was also a great movie for me to get picked because I love that movie as well. I remember seeing Ernest Scared Stupid, I think, on the Family Channel oh, back yep. in the day. And I think I liked it, but I think it was 1991, 1992. Like we're going back in oh, time. Oh, it's definitely, uh, it is definitely a p- uh, piece of 1991 for sure. <laughs> right. And I think I dug it. I don't, I haven't watched it again because it's not, Scott knows I probably wouldn't be my type of movie now, but maybe I should give it a shot because I find when I watch my childhood movies, I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, yeah, like it totally sure, ruins it for me. I'm sure you would roll your eyes heavily with a lot of the Ernest stuff, but I think you would love the practical effects in it. Nice. How about you, Mike? Have you seen Ernest Scared Stupid? Oh, yeah. I saw it when I, I might have seen it in the theater. I was pretty young, but uh, yeah, I think it actually does a decent job at trying to be scary in parts because, I mean, the, I, I believe the troll is like turning kids into like pieces of wood or something. Yep. Like, yeah, and uh, it's definitely Ernest being Ernest. Like, it's it's kind of like if you are a fan of Ernest, I feel like you're going to like most Ernest movies because I remember Ernest Goes to Camp and Ernest Goes to Jail. I was a big fan of. I think yep. there was one where he saved Christmas, too. Yep. Yes. <laughs> um, so it, it's like, okay, what else are we going to do? Do a Halloween movie. Um, and, and, yeah, the trolls, I found out recently they were actually the Killer Clowns costumes repainted to be yeah. Animals, so. Yes, certain ones were, yeah, repurposed uh, Killer Clowns, which was awesome. <laughs> you could yeah, and when you... When you see the side by side online, it it totally like it's not even hard to see, you know. Yeah, I'll say because you can pick them out easily. Like when you see them, and you're like, once you know that and you see them mm-hmm. on screen, you're going, oh shit, yeah, that's that clown. Okay. <laughs> now, just to be clear, we are giving spoilers, everyone. So I know we just spoiled 1991's Ernest Scared Stupid, <laughs> but just so you know, if we say a movie that was maybe recent, we will be giving away things that could spoil that movie. So listener discretion is advised. Mike, <laughs> what's your number five? <laughs> All right. So my number five, I actually got clarification on this just to make sure. Um, but you guys, uh, I the judges conferred and they said it is allowed. <laughs> so I actually had something originally written down, but I'm going to kind of expand it because I think it goes beyond just this specific show or series. Um, I had originally written down Treehouse of Horror because if we're talking about oh, yeah. actual, yeah, if we're talking about nice. actual Halloween traditions, you know, growing up, um, for those in my general age group, they might remember that Trials of Horror for a certain amount of years actually did air on Halloween itself. So yeah, I remember oh, yep. that. There, yeah, yeah. There's there are some years without how we would do it. We would go trick or treating, rush back to watch the episode, yep. and then go back out. Um, and those first like what six, seven, eight years of Trials of Horror, the parodies, the writing, the satire was so spot on. And the horror movies they were spoofing were usually very easily recognizable. I love the fact that um, they weren't canon for the normal series, so they could pretty much do anything they want with no repercussions for the regular series itself. Now, what I'm saying about expanding out of them, I'm actually going to expand it to just TV Halloween specials in general, like whether it's like Roseanne, Garfield. Yes. Nice. There was something special about seeing all these shows just get into the spirit. Now, the funny thing is I think Roseanne still 
I think their Halloween episodes still did feature canon for the regular series. Like they would, it did. Like, yeah, they would acknowledge the holidays going on, but there were still like story arcs that would carry over and just right through, which is fine. I mean, being able to manage to do that is a feat in itself. Yeah. But um, yeah, something about when we're talking growing up, the hall, ho- the actual holiday itself. There's something cool about just seeing like shows across the board just put on their costumes and get into the spirit. So yeah, that's my yep. number five. That's awesome. awesome. I have to say, and uh, that was that was not a purposeful throwback to my old podcast fan. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to say, like especially Roseanne, because that series when they got into Halloween, they got into Halloween. Like they did the yeah. whole haunted house thing. Roseanne as the character just loved Halloween. The whole family loved Halloween so you got to see some really awesome outfits like their halloween episodes are some of my favorites to revisit i just Mm -hmm. love them they fully embraced it yes and the treehouse horror a lot of those didn't have happy endings and i was you know i was a kid that was very nervous i think you know i've talked about that before in this podcast i did not get into horror until i was older not because my parents kept me from it because i was fucking terrified of a vampire commercial (laughs) on tv like I was just scared of everything. And the treehouse horror was something I could, I could digest because it was a cartoon, you know, and I knew it was the Simpsons and it was okay. And I still remember the quote, the Raven um, oh, yep. one very clearly. And I think that it really does have its place in pop culture history. And I'm really glad you brought it to the table, Mike. Cool. So, yeah, well, man. <laughs> have your daughters watched it? Uh, they will watch. Like I have the craziest thing with my kids. It's, my kids are impossible to try to get them to watch stuff but if mm. i just throw if i just throw it on like i'm watching it and they're in the room i always catch them like watching the stuff on the tv obviously you know it's just a natural thing so i've almost given up on being like come on let's watch this and i'm just putting it on and, and they'll eventually start watching that's you know what sometimes that's what you got to do you just got to trick people into shit that's how i get most of my relationships um <laughs> I, I, yeah i, I think God part of it's true. just <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think part of it is just so much content at their fingertips at this age, as opposed to when we were kids that there's so much stuff like they're already into themselves that it's like trying to break them from that stuff. It's, it's hard. Like, so I'm just like, I'm just good old Simpsons kids. This show's been on for 40 years almost. Yeah. I appreciate back, in it. Day, back in my day, our kids programming was on the TV. That's right. Parts yeah, of no shit. Praise Simpsons. Um, so my number five is a very, uh, it's an indie low budget movie, but it's a fun fucking movie. And it's called The Fun House Massacre from 2015. Nice. Uh, for the synopsis for people who haven't seen it is six of the world's scariest psychopaths escape from a local asylum and proceed to unleash terror on an unsuspecting crowd of Halloween at a uh, unsuspecting crowd at a Halloween fun house. So the mazes all represent, there's six mazes, I believe, and each maze represents one of the killers. So there's like a meat cutting one, there's like a teacher one. And I love this movie. I love movies based at haunts because I love going to haunts. It's my jam. And Robert Englund is in this movie. He's not in it for long. I do always love how he just shows up randomly for some cameos here and there. But this movie is fucking fun. Uh, some of the kills are great the ending how you think it's going to end and it <laughs> you think this one dude's going to survive and he doesn't it's just awesome it is fun there's one part that's my favorite is these two radio show hosts are there promoing the event and then one of the killers comes and kills the one radio show host and the radio show host keeps going because he thinks it's part of the gag and then yep. he ends up getting fucking killed it the comedy in this is bang on it's a simple watch. If you haven't watched it yet and you enjoyed things like um, other movies based at haunts, then I totally recommend it. It's a 2015 Funhouse Massacre. Have either one of you two seen it? Yes, I actually uh, seen it for the first time uh, doing it for uh, NFW with you and Nudie and all that. That's right. That was, yeah. that, that was a lot of fun. That was my pick. I forgot that you were on that episode. What yep. about you, Mike? I haven't, but because I'm on camera, you can see I am writing it down with this pen because oh you'll watch it (laughs) it's worth it like it's funny well one of the cool thing about list shows is like anything someone lists off and are enthusiastic about add it to my list so yeah i'm gonna check it out like from listening to you i think you'll like it it's a fun good gory fun little ride it's it's easy to sit through yeah it's a it's very entertaining nice all All right right. so my number four well it's from uh 
this one I actually got into probably about 10 years ago, did not know it existed for the longest time. And then the DVD became out of print. And thankfully I had bought it, not knowing that it was out of print, bought it for like five bucks. And it's from 1986. And before I even say the name of the movie, I just have to say, long live Sammy Kerr. So my pick is 1986 Trick or Treat. Nice. Uh, if you love uh, 80s metal and supernatural horror and Ozzy Osbourne and Gene Simmons, then this movie is right up your alley. <laughs> it is totally 80s. Uh, has some great music by a band called Fastway. And I believe that is one of the reasons why it's out of print is because the copyright issues with Fastway's music in it is uh, they lost the rights. So they were not able to do it. And I think you can find like a import in Germany or something like that, Blu-ray, but yeah, this is one mo one movie I hope to God sees the light of day and gets a U.S. release again because the DVD is, by the cover, it shows Gene Simmons and Ozzy Osbourne in it who are only in it for maybe like 30 seconds to a minute. And they are the main faces on the cover. So it's like, if you see, you're gonna be like, oh, this looks dumb. But yeah, it is such a good time. The special practical effects are a blast. The music is awesome. The characters in it are fun and quirky. Got yourself like, I totally related. I can't remember the character's name off the top of my head, but the main kid, I totally related hit with him because he was like the 80s metal nerd that uh, was idolizing Sammy Kerr before Sammy Kerr ended up get, uh, pretty much committing suicide. But you find out later that they, that was part of his plan to come back as like this supernatural demon to basically uh, uh, cause hell. And it's such a fun movie, but I can totally relate with the character because yeah, he just was always getting picked on for being the oddball that loved the 80s music and stuff like that and this is just one hell of a ride and one of these days heather i want i want to get your opinion on i it, still so. haven't watched it i know scotty it's bad i promise to watch it before halloween night this year okay i want to get your opinion on this yeah. see what you think <laughs> mike have you seen this yeah this one has a little mix of like all the 80s goodness you could want uh rock and roll and horror that kind of are a natural companion <laughs> to begin with yeah. uh I remember Large Marge is in this one. Oh, that's <laughs> right, she is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's funny. It, it kind of has your, like, typical uh, thing where sometimes, like, there's these, like, rock legends build in the movie, and you're like, oh, you're so excited to see them, and, like, they show up for, like, a scene. <laughs> yeah. Or two. Okay, that's, that, I guess that's better than nothing. But, yeah, it's, it's a totally fun movie, and it's the one that's often not talked about because of the more modern trick or treat. So. exactly <laughs> uh so yeah mike what would your number four be all right my number four this is a movie that man i've been watching since i was way too young to see it it involves you know a group of high schoolers that go to a halloween party at a possessed or demon possessed house it has a little bit of everything you would want a halloween party costumes the sleaze factor uh pretty good gory kills a cool animated opening credits sequence that uh, not enough people talk about the score is good and uh, it just kind of has everything you would want as like a new horror fan trying to consume stuff and because it actually involves you know uh, the party on the night of halloween you can't really go wrong with this one in my opinion and that would be night of the demons absolutely uh, yeah yeah man this it's it's one it's one of those movies i think for a while it wasn't being talked about anymore but it's kind of made its way back into you know the minds of a lot of horror friends and i i, I just think it in, it encapsulates everything about kind of those high school years and wanting to like go to the spooky halloween party or you know here's this old abandoned house uh let's just be brave and go throw a party in there and of course hijinks and scary stuff ensues and then i like the kind of little side plot going on with the uh the angry neighbors that yes. he gets his it feels like so random like that almost feels like it would be like a wraparound in a, in a different type of movie yes like, it looks like an anthology it, wraparound it, for sure yeah and it gets a payoff at the end anyway so i was like oh that's pretty cool to do so yeah night of the demons man one of my all-time faves i fucking great fucking movie love, man yeah i fucking love that movie and one of the best uh, uses of a Baja song when they're uh, <laughs> with Angela dancing with that crazy ass strobe. I love that yes. scene so much. And talk yeah. about like your random high school or fucking drinking Halloween party in the middle of nowhere. Like it is, yeah, it, it encompasses Halloween for sure. That's awesome, Mike. Yeah, because it, it definitely feels like the, 
like any real life group of friends, it starts out innocent enough. Oh, let's just go throw a party in the spooky house. And uh, the way it just kind of devolves into what it is or what it does, it, it's really cool. That's awesome. And, and I just, and I always use this line, but eat a bag of fucks. I'm here to party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you use that line all the time. You love I that do. line. I fucking actually. love that line. <laughs> it's your jam. <laughs> Um, well, my my fourth is probably going to be mixed for a lot of people, but I fucking love this movie, movie when it came out, and that's Hellfest 2018. Nice. Um, and I understand that it's a very, you know, basic paint by numbers plot here. We're looking at three young ladies who go with three gentlemen, one girl who's reconnecting with a high school crush, and they go to this theme park. But for anyone who's ever been to something like Universal Studios or Canada's Wonderland up here, um, this is exactly what it's like going to this shit at a big theme park. You go through, there's tons of people there. The, there's these haunts that are that are done. There's random people like Tony Todd doing performances in the street. Like I remember watching shit like that at Canada's Wonderland when I went a couple of years ago. And I love the idea of a killer being there and no one believes the main protagonist. There's one point where she comes out of the washroom and she says to a security guard, like, he's here. There's someone trying to kill me. He's like, everyone's trying to kill you. It's Halloween. What the fuck are you talking about? Basically, like, that's the point of this park is to scare you. And I just thought it was really clever. One of the scenes that really sticks out to me is when she's stuck in the cart, they're going to the extra scary area and the figure, the killer's walking towards her and she's trying to get out and she can't. I thought that was excellent. Um, same with the head chopping scene. Thought that was excellent. I, I know that there's some people that don't love this film, but as you can see, I love haunts. And I thought this film captured the paranoia, paranoia of what could happen at a haunt perfectly. Any thoughts? What yeah, do you guys think? I, I went to theaters to see this one. And I got to say right now, it is such, it was such a missed fucking opportunity for this movie because they put it out in November in theaters. It's like, why didn't you do this in October? This would have been perfect yeah, for October. Yeah, that's weird that they didn't do that in October. I didn't realize that because I watched it on, on video, VOD. Oh, okay. I didn't watch it yeah, in theaters, I, so. Yeah, because I remember it was uh, yeah in, in November and I went by myself to see it because like I do with a lot of matinees and mm -hmm. I just had a fucking blast with this film. It is just... Like you said, it's paint by numbers, but it's just so fun. And I love that setting of like, the because it does remind me of like what Universal Studios does for their Halloween Horror Nights. I've never been there and I've always wanted to go. And just seeing that on the screen, I thought that was like, that is a perfect setup for a horror film. And yeah. it's just like, I enjoyed the hell out of this movie a lot. And I know it gets kind of panned a little bit here and there, but I don't get it because I love it. It was made for the masses, right? Yeah. And, but it's made for people who have gone to, you know, up here, Canada's Wonderland is the biggest theme park in Canada. It's located in Toronto, which is about 45 minutes from me. Like it fucking captured that, that atmosphere and makes you go, what if, yeah. what if someone did come in there and have malicious intentions? They could probably get away with a couple of murders to be quite fucking honest with you before someone would catch it. Oh, absolutely. There's just that many people there, right? What do you think, Mike? Any thoughts? Yeah. I've always personally loved like uh, theme parks, carnivals, sideshows, uh, all that kind of stuff. It makes for a great horror setting because I think there's like a natural anxiety when you're younger, just being immersed in that setting, because there's so much stuff going on, there's so many different mixes of everything that just that alone could get you paranoid and uh, in trouble yourself. Yeah, this movie, um, when it came out, yeah, I remember it was being very kind of polarizing between people who loved it and people who just thought it fell flat. But I think it works. I think it works um, as a movie. And I like, you know, it's kind of the gags I do in it. And I'm just like, you can't not be scared at a theme park. Right. It's, <laughs> right, a, right? it's a fun, fluffy movie made for the masses, but I had a good time with it. So I'm glad mm -hmm. you guys have a good time with it too. So we'll move on to Scotty's number three. All right. So my number three, we're going a little bit further back in time to watch one of my favorite black and white horror classics. And that is a uh, 1959's William Castle's uh, ha House on Haunted Hill with what? good old Vincent Price. And just because I'm on camera, I'm can show. I'm wearing my House on Hill shirt with a cat in front of me. But <laughs> fucking love this movie. Vin everyone knows that by now that Vincent Price is the fucking man. I love him to death. 
I love everything about him. And this is my first introduction to him was seeing this film at a very young age. And since then, it has become a Halloween tradition that I always watch it around the middle of October just to get myself hyped for the time of year it is. And I mean, what more to say besides this is like a just fun, like not even real haunted house movie because it's just all like just set up to scare people. But the acting in it and the toxic relationship that Vincent Price has with his wife of talking about how he tried to poison her last year and this and that. And it's just so quirky and just like tongue in cheek, but just so much fucking fun. And I'll say, and I um, have you guys both seen this? Yeah, I just watched it first time watch this year and much respect for this film. Wasn't what I thought it was going to be because I saw the remake first. Yes. Um, so that's, you know, but I know Mike's like bad, Heather, but <laughs> I really did enjoy the 1959 and I'm so glad you brought that to your to our list. Well, thank you. Yeah, say, how about you, Mike? Yeah, I was waiting for Scott to say the 1999 one and I was like, oh man, what am I going to say about it? <laughs> <laughs> um but as far as the original, yes, it's amazing. I actually am a huge fan of William Castle, period. I, a lot of people refer to him as kind of like the B-movie version of Hitchcock because in a handful of his movies, he really tries to do like the same, not the same, but just a similar nature in twists. Um, with a lot of psychological stuff, it just comes off more, you know, a little more cheesy because just William Castle movies are a lot smaller and scoped than the huge um ideas that hitchcock is putting in his films but i want to say william castle stuff just works for me man and i totally can see why uh, house on Haunted hill would be something for halloween it, it just feels like that you know the spooky fun uh content that you would want on a holiday if you're putting together like a marathon of movies on halloween house on Haunted hill definitely belongs in that lineup Oh, it absolutely does. I like whenever I go to like, it's been a while since I did it, but look, I used to do uh, like a Halloween night at friends' houses and we'd just binge watch a bunch of different horror films and we'd each bring a couple movies to the table. And this is one that I'd always bring with me. Yeah, man. If you, I, I'm not sure how uh, familiar you are with William Castle outside of this film, but if you haven't seen a lot of his other stuff, just uh, look him up and look up his uh, profile and start busting those out because they, they're really good. Yeah, I'll say, because I grew up with 13 Ghosts, the original, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I, my stepdad was a huge fan of William Castle, so that's kind of how I got into these movies, and if I remember correctly, The Tingler is also William Castle, isn't it? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, because I know he always loved to do those, like, uh, hokey theater, theatrical experiences with something going on in the theater, like, then with a tingler, you got the vibrating seats to make you feel like you're getting electrified because the tingler's running loose in the theater and things like that. So, like, I know that's like William Castle's thing. And yeah, I think those are like the three main ones that I've seen. I know there's more that I've seen, but I just can't remember them off the top of my head. But yeah, I've I grew up on a lot of William Castle stuff. Yeah, heck yeah. That's um, awesome. And how about you, Mike? What is your number three? All right. My number three, the movie starts with the letter H. <laughs> but uh but to many people's surprise it ends with a number and that would be halloween three season nice. absolutely now now this is a movie i want to say i probably have done the biggest 180 on but you got to remember when i first saw it, it i feel like in the modern area era and when i say modern i'm gonna say the last 20 years I don't think this gets as much hate on the first watch as it mm -hmm. used to because no, I think people are much more prepared and they have the context going in. Well, me personally, the first time I saw it, I was a kid growing up in the midst of like, I'm just going to rent every horror movie I can on the VHS rack at the video store, right? Yeah. So I get to Halloween 3 and even though it's subtitled Season of the Witch, that doesn't mean much to a, you know, a 10-year-old. Like I, I didn't right. look into it further. There was no internet movie database or YouTube reviews I could look up. So I'm watching it and like half hour, 45 minutes in, I'm like, what is this? And then I, I just didn't like it because of that reason. Rewatch it a few years later when I understand what's going on. And I was like, wow, I was dumb. This is actually pretty good and entertaining and fun in its own right. Then you learn about Carpenter's original you know, intention with the annual Halloween movie that's totally different from each other. Then you start putting it together and you're like, wow, okay, maybe they should have stuck to that given the Halloween franchise, which I'll <laughs> stay mum about now. But um, yeah, I just, I, I love it. I, I love the whole idea with the mask. Like how, 
if if you're gonna take out uh, kids worldwide, what's uh, the easiest way to do it? Do it on a holiday with with masks that they're all gonna put on. And man, what a what a gut punch of an ending, right? Where he's yeah. he's gonna do it. He's gonna save the day. Oh, yeah. turn it off. Turn it off. It. Turn it off. Turn it off. Turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that silver shamrock theme, you know, it, it oh, yeah. probably gets stuck in the head unintentionally every year. Well, I was going to say, that's what makes that truly a, like, Halloween movie to watch, just because it's like, it's got the, even the song, eight more days till Halloween, yeah. Halloween, Halloween. And, and um, really, if you isolate the score out, like, if you just go listen to the, uh, the score in its entirety on YouTube or somewhere, the score is really good, like, the synthesized oh, yeah. music, it's just it's eerie it's jarring but it's so fun to listen to and obviously it's it's almost iconic in its own right right it, it's hard to say it's iconic when you're talking because obviously the original carpenter score of the original but outside of that i, I just think it, it's it's jarring in all the right ways yeah agreed because um and the, i'm gonna actually kind of tell a little story here because uh you were saying how you know people nowadays like know going into it what to expect so mm-hmm. i think that's why a lot of people like it and what to expect there's no michael myers everyone spoiler yes <laughs> but spoiler um, for halloween three uh but for me i caught it probably late 80s and it was uh kind of a similar story with friday the 13th nightmare on elm street blah 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 where my stepdad brought home the entire halloween vhs collection at the time uh because he worked as a video distributor and he brought them home mainly for me because he knew i was uh, big into the horror films and i never when i was a kid i never started with number one number two number three i always went by what had the coolest looking cover so for me (laughs) Halloween three was my first introduction to the Halloween franchise. So I loved this movie from the very first time watching it. Cause I had no idea who the fuck Michael Myers was. I didn't care at the time. Like this just was a unique movie to me. And then I went back and watched all the other ones and I'm going, okay, this one doesn't fit in this franchise at all. What's going on here. <laughs> but like, I was completely clueless to it at the time. And I think that helped me enjoy the movie from the very beginning. So I saw Halloween three when I was 17 Oh, nice. So I had already seen the other Halloweens and I'm like, oh, I must have missed this one. I put it in. I'm like, no, there's no Michael Myers in this one. Is it part of the series? Must not be part of the series. I'll just watch it on its own accord and liked it. (laughs) So I never (laughs) had any of the um, anger Mm -hmm. that was associated with it because I just automatically assumed it wasn't part of the series. I'm like, oh, they must have just named it Halloween, like, you know, similarly, but it's like a completely different plot line. Mm -hmm. And I never got, I never realized how angry people were until I started joining horror groups on Facebook. I had no idea that people had actually got like upset about this and this was a thing um yeah i think it's a great film i honestly it's probably better than the other films if we look at well i guess a lot of people can argue halloween one is the best but if we look at tom atkins delivery of lines and the concept of the plot line it's actually pretty clever like it really Mm -hmm. you know and not that you know any of our halloween films need to make sense but you could kind of be like yeah it could get kids buying these masks and like in bulk and maybe if you were able to put a spell when you're producing these masks and use a specific kind of rock like it's not a bad concept how they thought how they thought it through like it really wasn't bad for that time era and i I agree as long as catchy as shit like what is smart marketing it's like you got you got mask uh you got robots and wait is that stonehenge (laughs) yeah right like it's it's you know what i mean but it's it's kind of like and then we got michael myers who beats up buster rhymes which is definitely my number one halloween resurrection number one number one halloween film of the year I, 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 best, best halloween film in the series i that's uh, off this podcast right now <laughs> so one one scene in halloween three that i love every time and it's kind of a more unassuming scene it's uh when atkins is kind of out he's kind of started kind of to look around and spy on a factory to see what's going on when he runs into the homeless guy that's just yes. giving his drunken rant on yes. conquer music like uh you think you'd hire some of us local boys and no he, he brought in all like he just does such a great drunk like kind of angry yeah. put out of work bum that's like yeah. he's suffering the wrath and then he gets uh his uh punishment i guess for speaking out you know? but it moved the plot along that was the <laughs> best thing about that shit it moved the plot along 
Yeah, yeah it's, good expo- oh God, it's good exposition right? of how right? Cochrane came in and kind of like took over the town on a scene. And kept like, his people there so he could control the manufacturing. No one would know what he was doing. Like it was, it was smart. Um, so I'm glad he brought it to the table. I just put but. a connection to uh, modern day with this. Cochrane is Jeff Bezos and <laughs> Amazon is putting all the others out of work. So that's where the poor drunk guy is. So yeah. The I better, all connecting. Oh, and, and as, soon as, as, as soon as Amazon's able to, they'll be using robots too. Don't, right, exactly. Uh, don't put it and they'll make masks. <laughs> they probably already do. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Heather, what is your number three? Uh, So my number three is a movie that has Art the Clown in it, but it isn't Terrifier. Mm. It is All Hallows' Eve 2013. Nice. Um, I love All Hallows' Eve 2013. I think that movie is fucking awesome. I think the wraparound is great with them finding a random. It's hard to work now because I think most people would be like VHS. I don't even have a fucking player to play this on, right? Like, I think it it does kind of date itself when you use things like VHS, but there is something creepy to be said about a VHS tape, hence, hence all the VHS movies that we've had. So, especially, unfortunately, the most recent one, but I'm not talking <laughs> about that. Uh, I, I love the first one with the subway and, like, you just see the chains and the woman is chained and she's trying to get her out. And, oh, my God, it's just so fucking dark. Oh, it really is. I just think that the ending wraparound where she literally goes to check the children and he's standing there with blood all over himself, where, you know, you assume that he killed the kids. That scene always stands out to me. Like, that's your nightmare as a babysitter. And how it moved from, what is it that it's the breaking, is it the fourth wall, Scott? Yes. The fourth wall. Um, I just, I thought All Hallows Eve was brilliant. I think for a low budget indie film, this is horror done right. You keep areas blacked out when you need to. You rely a lot on sound effects and you save your money for the gore that is needed. And this movie did an exceptional job of it. Uh, what do you gentlemen think? I assume you've seen them, seen All Hallows Eve. Oh yeah. Um, I think this is a very fun anthology. Uh, very underrated, honestly, because you don't hear, you know, well, you didn't really hear much about it until Terrifier came out. And then it like started picking up in popularity because I had like the first introduction in uh, Art the Clown, which I got to say the final Art the Clown segment in that movie is the so- The gas station? Yeah, that one yeah. is so gory and creepy. And you can definitely see like, ah, this is where Terrifier came to be right here. Mm -hmm. And like how mean spirited it is. And yeah, just every story I thought worked really well. Like, I think the only one that was lower on my list was I think the alien one in this. Yeah, because it's weird how it ties into art. You just have like a picture. Yeah. Right. But like. But it was still had some creepy moments to it. And like every story like was very creepy. And I did like the wraparound in this because, yeah, that is a really creepy thing to just find some random unmarked VHS. Well, and how they're watching it and they keep watching it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, how about you, Mike? Yeah, the intro to Art the Clown for sure is amazing. And I think anthologies just go with the holiday itself too, because usually when you're writing stories for an anthology, there's some type of like morality tale or lesson. And when you kind of have a holiday associated with kids going out and have, having fun, getting all sorts of candy um, and all the, all the you know quote unquote mischief going on on Halloween, having um some type of i I guess quasi lessons in your horror uh are always good and that's what anthologies usually specialize in and yeah it's fun and you know it's always cool to look back on the origins of art the clown as far as like where he made his first appearance and i think that's totally cool when a character from an anthology um gets his own full length like movie and now a sequel. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. always cool to see that. And he's become kind of an icon now. Mm-hmm. I would say he's a he's a very slow burning icon, but yes. I do think among horror fans, he's recognized. He doesn't obviously have the level that a lot of, you know, I always use non horror fans as a basis to how well known an icon is. Right. If I have mm-hmm. a friend that's never watched a horror movie, but she knows who a certain character is, that's a well known icon. If she has no idea, it's not a well known icon. But I think right. Art the Clown for this generation in this decade is an excellent slasher and we won't get into the slasher debate right now but i think that he you know is a very simplistic application of scariness and i and i think you know revises the whole clown thing i think it is great but pennywise has been around for a very long time 
this was something that was new that was in the 2010s that has been great, you know, and continues to develop. So yeah, there's great. always uh, there's always that level where something transcends from being horror to just straight up pop culture yeah. icon. You know? Yeah, absolutely. All right, Scotty, number two. Uh, all right. So my number two is a little less known film from 1974 and it is young frankenstein what? no one's ever heard of this one what are you talking about oh. shocked at your list scott i did not see these coming <laughs> at all um well, did the guy is... direct anything else so that's what i want to know oh, mel brooks no i don't think anybody's heard of mel brooks at all i mean Who space falls what <laughs> So I am going to say it right here because I know a lot of people do not like this movie and I am a champion for it. And that is Dracula dead and loving it. Fucking love that movie. <laughs> I like that movie too. It's fun. Uh, but yeah, I, once again, this is another one that I grew up watching when I was a kid, my parents introduced it to me and I had seen this before I even seen the original Frankenstein. So I, this was my introduction to Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. And the comedy in this is just so perfect to me. Like it's one of my all time favorite, I guess you'd call it horror comedies. And uh, Gene Wilder, just like, he's one of my favorite comedians from back in the day. And like, I just love everything about this film. It's that got that gothic feel of the original Frankenstein, uh, has just some very corny lines and just some very quirky characters. And like, this movie works as a complete whole for me. As And yeah, I once again, kind of like House on Haunted Hill, it doesn't set, it's not set around Halloween, but around this time of year is when I have to sit down and watch it. It is like my tradition. For sure. I've seen it. I You've feel like, and it? I and I really like Mel Brooks films, like a oh, lot. Oh, you, you yeah. gotta see this movie. Oh, so I gotta oh watch God. it. I'll like it because I like all Mel Brooks movies. I think they're all funny. I, Blazing Saddles, like obviously humors has grown and developed from the time that that, you know, movie was yeah. made. But there are, you know, I do think there is some value to taking a movie at its face value of when it was made. Um, so yes, I definitely need to check this out. Yeah, especially because it's like it fits right in the horror genre. So it's like it fits with the first time watches that we always do too. So you would, yeah, I, I recommend you check this out because I would love to hear your thoughts on it. And I think you would laugh your ass off. <laughs> yeah, as far as far as I go, much like Scott, I saw Young Frankenstein before I had seen Frankenstein. And I already thought it was hilarious. But then after you see Frankenstein and go back and watch Young, it's like takes on a whole new level of funny because of how right. accurate they are in their in their satire right it's 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 uncanny how how good of a job and whenever you see a horror comedy like that where they just nail everything it it gives you a better appreciation because you're like the the writer director must have had a love for the source material in the first place you know this isn't make you know it's not they're not doing this because they thought the original was no good. It's because they love the original and they want to spread more joy and sheer base off the original. And it is so good. I mean, that I love the scene um, when uh, Gene Wilder is like, whatever you do, do not open the door. <laughs> and then when, when he gets in there, open the door. <laughs> like, so Puts the candle good back <laughs> gene wilder uh, i mean not just in this movie but man if this is your introduction to gene wilder anybody uh it's it's all as good as he is in everything he's in it it sets the bar so high just oh it does like yeah. his performance in this is incredible and it, it's probably my favorite film of his and i love a lot of his and richard Pryor stuff that he did they did together too and but yeah this is top tier gene wilder for me i fucking love this movie mm -hmm. awesome. and any, anytime a horror comedy can stand on its own uh you know you have something excellent absolutely yeah, exactly uh mike what is your number two all right so just a little bit ago i was talking about anthologies and how i think they fit perfect with the holiday so why not an anthology that takes place on the holiday of halloween this one has a similar title to something on scott's <laughs> list but uh, let's take the O out of the, the or and make it trick or treat. <laughs> yeah. Or trick or treat, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, yeah, I just love it. The funny story going back, this one was um, shelved by the studio. I yeah. don't, I have no idea why. Like, I because remember. They're assholes. They're just idiots. I mean, I remember seeing a trailer for it and then like two years went by and I was like, where the hell is this movie? And they just eventually released it on Blu-ray, like out of nowhere. So I, I go get it, throw it on. And I'm like, how the hell did they not think this would make money in the theaters? Like mate, 
maybe because Anna Paquin wasn't like huge star at the time and they thought she wasn't enough to care, but I'm like, just release it like the week of Halloween. People will go see this. And it's all it's pretty much beloved across the board now and justifiably so. And it's just a, you know, a small example of the theaters or studio heads not understanding what they have on their hands. And uh I, I think, you know, I, I don't want to say as a matter of fact that this was the first movie to do it, but I think it, it was part of the modern trend with uh wraparound stories really being incorporated in the main movie i thought it was a very uh brilliant and at the time a new feeling thing to do and uh i just love all the stories in this i love how they all meld together it's creepy it's scary at parts and the stories are fun and i you know i think it's almost a perfect movie Yep, I completely agree. Like this, uh, Michael Doherty just needs to continue working on uh, holiday themed horror films because he seems to just nail the aspect of what the holidays are about. Because Trick or Treat, it's literally as you're watching it going, this is literally the season Halloween on film. It's like everything about it just feels like Halloween. And How cool is the town? Like, I want to be yeah. in that town on Halloween. <laughs> right? Like, throwing huge-ass Halloween parties out in the middle of the streets, and just, like, everybody seems to be into the spirit of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about uh, Tara Art the Clown being, like, a icon for the horror masses. Um, Sam is one of those where I would say it's in between the people that don't watch horror and the horror fans with being a horror icon. He's like surpassed art and he's on his way to being well known across the world because he's only had one movie, but yet you see images of him everywhere. And in Halloween stores, there's costumes of him now. And like he's he's become he's becoming one of the good icons that people that don't watch horror films will know eventually. Uh, not yet. Not yet. No, say, that's what I'm saying. He's on his not way. Yet. Yeah, he's yeah, on he's... his way, though. I will agree with yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I, a little louder for the people in the back. Both of you gentlemen nailed it. Excellent anthology. I think it's a perfect Halloween movie. Um, I think all the shorts are great. I think the acting is fucking high quality in every single one. But you're looking at some pretty decent names you have in these in this yeah. um, in this movie. You know, you get mm -hmm. decent actors, you get a good production bu budget, you get good directing, good writing, entertaining, doesn't overstay its welcome. Give me a sequel is how I feel. So mm -hmm. thanks for bringing it to the table, Mike. It's awesome. Cool, Love yeah. this movie. I, I assumed you guys liked it too, but you never know. <laughs> hey, right. no. What is there not to like? We're, we have good taste, Mike. Well, somewhat. <laughs> hey, somewhat. You Oh, I, two of you have good taste. Heather keeps telling me I don't, but. <laughs> no, your taste has surprised me today. Gremlins hasn't come up once, so that's been oh, great. Oh, there's still a number one to come. Oh, for fuck my life. <laughs> so my number two, um, I'm sticking with the 2010s, uh, is the houses that October, the houses October built. Oh, nice. Um, I thought this was a phenomenal found footage film. Uh, Scotty and I watched this. I think we covered it last Halloween. We talked. Yeah, we did it for our, well, not for our Halloween, but we did it for our haunt, uh, haunted attractions episode. Yes, yes. Um, I fucking love this movie. I love the concept that they're going around to these different haunts. Now, I think there was like a documentary they were making at the same time. And then this movie kind of, they did this too. Is that how it worked? Or is that just I, a rumor I heard? I think there was like a mix of the two going on together. Right? I could be wrong on that. So I love how they piss off those random people because I have been in haunts. I've, I've gone to a lot of them. And there's always those people that take it a little too seriously. Right. Um, I was telling Scotty that, I went to this thing called Haunted Manor. This was a couple of years ago. And I had one of the characters get right in my face and tell me she was going to slit my throat, uh, which is fine. It's a haunt. Uh, but I was like, that's a probably a little much for 2019 to be doing that. Um, there was another dude who was Jason who came charging towards me. And of course I was just like, Jason, Jason, Jason. <laughs> and then like, we took a selfie together and I told him how much I loved his costume. And he was like, I know this is like the best ever. So I, I think you get a mix of people, which is what I liked that October, the houses that October built talked about. It showed yes. people that do take it too far. And it went into the area of extreme haunts. Now, the second one isn't as good, but I do really appreciate what the first one was trying to do, the interviews they did, talking to people. And I don't believe there's criminal reference checks. Um, when I watched Haunters, the haunt, Haunters, Art of the Scare. Oh, yeah. yeah there's not, <laughs> right, in some of these haunts. So I thought that that was really interesting. So have you seen this movie, Mike? I'm sorry, Mike. Mike went on yep. mute. 
I was I was taking a drink of water and I was like, oh, she's coming to me first. Oh uh, yes, I have seen it, and I I think uh, movies about haunts, haunted houses, haunted attractions, haunted anything, perfect for the holiday. And I I totally agree that like in I would say in what the last decade, maybe 15, 20 years even, there's kind of become this fine line between haunted attractions and hey, pay us to torture you yeah. <laughs> like for the and. Yeah. There's everything in between where, you know, depending on your experience, your tolerance. Me personally, I don't get the let's pay to torture you. Like, I don't want to be tortured and I don't want to pay you to do it. But I love haunted attractions. Like, I love that end of it. Um, You know, as far as people jumping out and scaring you, oh, that's perfect. I just I don't want to be tied up and put in a coffin. And uh, yet, no, that that'll happen eventually anyway. right? (laughs) And hopefully we won't be able for it. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. but uh, yeah, I've always loved uh, movies and the idea of like, oh, we're seeking out like the ultimate haunt. Uh, we're the people that have seen everything. You can't get us. Yeah. Well, I think this movie's going to get you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Another perfect uh, movie with a theme for Halloween. Awesome. And Scott, you've yeah. seen it. I, I think you oh, yeah. did it. Yeah. Right. You told yeah, me. I, that. I really dig this freaking movie. It's super creepy, and it it's literally people like us that are the characters. Yeah. Which just fits. And you know, like, it should be our horror podcasting community. Yeah, right. It would be fitting. It would be. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I really dig the hell out of this movie. And I, I didn't even think about this one, like, for the list. I was like, oh, well, as soon as you mentioned it, it was like, damn, that would have been a good one. Now, hey, we got a variety going on, but now we've made it to numero uno. So, Scotty. All nice. right. So I have a feeling I may be stealing at least possibly someone's uh, number one here because it has not been mentioned yet. But. I'm going to go basic bitch here, but if you're going to go for the Halloween season, there's only one film that truly is the king of Halloween. Hubie's Halloween. Yes. <laughs> and that would be, of course, John Carpenter's classic 1978 Halloween. Like, I fucking love this movie. This is a literally Halloween night tradition for me every year. Just it's the score, the atmosphere to it, uh, just the low budget style of this film like do it yourself like filmmaking guerrilla style like john carpenter and his crew have done and to come out with such a tense horror film that just i don't know how to say it but it's like one of the first slasher films like that i've seen that was bloodless but yet also one of the more terrifying ones mm-hmm. at the time when i first seen it like just the use of lighting and shadow in this movie really make this stand out and make I, I can see why Michael Myers is who he is and why we still have a billion movies and one that just came out. But whoa, nothing... whoa. a Halloween movie came out? Yeah. It was why called, is someone uh, talking about it? It's called Halloween, Hubie's Cousin. Oh, great. <laughs> okay, cool. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just love this movie. And I know like this is like probably everyone's like go to Halloween movie, but I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't not add it to the list. Mike, have you heard this film before? You know, it's been on my watch list for a while. <laughs> I think this may finally be the year I get around to it, if I'm lucky. You totally you should. I think I hear there's like some it. sequels too. You might want. Oh, yeah, you might want yeah. to watch those too. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about those. It, it really depends how good the original is. If if that's decent, maybe I'll dive into a sequel or two. Yeah, right, right. No, but seriously, seriously, yeah iconic score probably the most recognizable score across you know not just horror but all cinema period i got the privilege to see john carpenter do it live at his concert a handful of years back yeah um it's a very serious horror movie like for a slasher it's it's almost minimal minimalist in its approach but that's why it works so well because it's the scenario set up is very real i love i it something that i think is important that starts to get lost with the sequels is there's a very fine uh rope they walk between is he supernatural is he just doing like is he extraordinary or is he just doing extraordinary things and i think that's that's all with with what the original set up that's a line you have to walk and i think as the franchise goes on they veer a little too much in one direction Mm -hmm. for it to and that's that's why it's never been replicated as well as the original and when it veers off it's why i have a problem with it later on where other people don't which is fine everyone has their own opinion on it but for me personally i think there it was 
just the entire aura around Michael Myers was designed so perfect where actually I've always made the argument that it's Dr. Loomis that gives him his mystique in the yes. original. When you, any scene where you hear Loomis talk about Michael, that's what puts in your head, well, what the hell are we dealing with here? It's, it's not right. always just Michael's actions himself. It's Dr. Loomis describing the horror of what he's witnessed over the years of trying to reach him. Right. Um, his exposition is just like some of my favorite in all of cinema, but uh, yeah, I mean, we can go on forever about the original. It's, it's legendary. Great. Love it. How could you not pick it for one? Right. Yeah. Right. I, it, it's number one for a reason. Well, and I think if anyone hasn't had a chance yet, please check out the Netflix series movies that made us. Yes. Um, it, they cover Halloween is one of the first ones. And I think that if you're not a huge Halloween fan, like I like how, don't get me wrong. I enjoy the movie quite a bit. I think it's phenomenal. I definitely have more respect for it now after watching it and realizing what they had to work with, especially that opening scene that they filmed the last, you want to watch something fucking fascinating, watch that segment. Yeah. Uh, finding out that Donald Pleasant was absolutely hammered for half of that movie, <laughs> like really hammered. Also very entertaining. Um, you know, I, I think it has its place in cinema history and I think Netflix acknowledged that. So Mike, what's mm -hmm. your number one? Well, like I said, how could you not pick Halloween for number one, right? Which is exactly why I didn't. Um, <laughs> um, we'll get to that once we get to honorable mentions. But um, I picked one relatively recent, although I can't believe it's already been eight years because I had to look up on IMDb because I, like, I know it's somewhat recent, but where are we in this? But yeah, it's been eight years. So I feel like this as a number one pick or even being on the list at all might be polarizing because I think this is a movie that works better for people that have a personal connection to what this film kind of depicts and what it represents. It's a very small indie film, but for someone who me, who, like me, who grew up, you know, uh, mid eighties to mid nineties was kind of my kid to teenage years. This is what it felt like when you turned on the TV on Halloween. This is what was on the local networks in the on the evening news when they were like, oh, let's go do uh, let's go out in the neighborhood and let's look up something spooky in the most cheesiest way possible. This is such an accurate depiction of that that I I feel bad and not condescending wise, but I just feel bad for people who didn't get that experience growing up because I don't know if local news networks still do this type of thing. Yeah. But man, WNUS special. It yes. I have to throw it on every year. <laughs> you know, it's when I first threw it on, it just totally took me back. And I was like, the people who made this obviously grew up like that too, because it's so accurate. I I almost like to play a game every where I throw it on for people that don't know it's a movie and see how long it takes for them to realize, no, this isn't just an old VHS tape I found in like a box somewhere. This is an actual movie based on what we all saw when we were growing up. And I, I just think uh, the way it, 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 for a point you don't know, like is something really going to seriously happen to the character or is it just all put on like the local news networks right. were in their specials. And as it just goes on and on, I just get more impressed with it. And it's a total fun time. And man, that is the news in my childhood, exactly what it was like. I, I love it. And it's become an annual watch for me. So WNUF special, my number one. I just watched that as a first time watch this year. Just recently, actually. Nice. Yeah, I, I did enjoy it as much as you did, but I think it's I think it's um, beyond creative. Mm -hmm. I think that movie like took every other Halloween film and said, fuck this shit, we're going to do our own thing. And I really respect that movie because of it. I think you're right. It captured the 90s perfectly. And I think the acting in it is really good. Like, I think it's a lower budget film too. Like, I don't think it had a high budget that it was working with. And it was, mm. it used its budget well and it's entertaining. I'm glad I finally saw it. Like, I feel like I was in a miss for not seeing it. Yep. And for me, I actually watched this for the first time last year around this oh, time of year. Nice. Yeah. So um, that's why it did not make my list because I've only watched it once, but I, this is one that would be in rotation. I can totally see that because it's uh, like everything you guys said, it, literally captures what the news was like back then in the 90s around that time of year just to get the ratings by going to some like abandoned house or to some haunted place and it's kind of funny because I actually watched uh because I've been on a Tales from the Crypt uh binge lately and there was mm -hmm. an episode 
very similar to what happens in WNUF with a newscaster that's going to a haunted house for a Halloween thing just to get the ratings and then something happens. Mm-hmm. And yeah, this movie is just fun. It definitely has that 90s feel, like the late 80s, 90s, early 90s feel. And like, I was just enamored with it when I watched it. Like, I probably should not have been watching it at work because I didn't end up getting <laughs> much work done because I was just too glued to my screen watching it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah this is this is one that I will definitely be having in my constant October rotation now for sure. Great pick, Ooh. Mike. Thanks for bringing it to the table. All uh, right, Heather, number one for you. You know what it is, Scott, guaranteed because I haven't said it yet. And Scott knows this is one of my all-time favorite movies. It is Haunt from 2019. Yes. I love this film. I will never stop loving this film. As you can tell, I love haunts. No. This film is like every fucking worst nightmare. And if you've gone to these butt fuck nowhere like haunted houses, it's not far off from what it looks like when you drive up to it. And they go through, they got that room where you go to feel what's in the bucket. They see that chick get killed and they think it's just part of the show. And it's not. And one of my favorite scenes is when they get outside and it's the dude with the one guy and he goes, would you like to see what my face looks like? Oh, that's so cool. And that scene alone, I was like, fuck yeah, movie. Fuck yeah. Uh, The scene where she's trying to get away from the final killer or one of the killers at the end in that bedroom. Like it is just overall love it love it love it thank god this movie was made it's on shutter i can't praise it enough haunt is my number one that is such a fun film so freaking fun mike are you a fan yeah and it kind of came out of nowhere too like um i don't think it had like a huge amount of fanfare like leading up to its release it just kind of got released at the right time and i mean with the name like haunt you're gonna assume it's related to haunt stuff and Yes, it was. And then you think the movie's over, and then we get that final scene at the house, and it's like, oh, the final showdown, right? But it's, yeah, yeah, I'm, glad, cool. I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you enjoyed it as well. Yeah, I remember we did this on Fresh Cuts, and I think Moods was a guest on that one, and it yep. almost turned into like a half haunt, half candy corn episode because we had seen that movie Candy Corn at the same time. But yeah, man, it's a fun one. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I'll get it. My, I'll get my shout outs now just because we're on me. Yep. Uh, so my shout outs, a lot of them were already mentioned, but I do love Halloween four five. I do love that storyline of Jamie Lee Curtis having, or Lori having a daughter, Jamie and Jamie, especially four five gets a little silly, but I always did dig four quite a bit. Um, there was a lower budget one that came out in 2007 called house of fear, which I feel like it's, you know, another haunt one where a group of teenagers go to a haunt and they go through and they end up being killed off as they go through and they're just trying to survive to get out. It's also really cool and uh, really, I found it entertaining. The Scare House 2014 about young ladies getting revenge against each other using a haunted yep. house as a cover. And finally, one of my all-time favorite films is Sleepy Hollow from 1999. Nice. Yeah. That, that is a good list of... Uh... What was the House of Fear? I don't think I've seen. No, so. a lot of people haven't seen. I think it's on Prime, so you could probably check it out there. Okay, I'll have to watch that because, yeah, I'm trying to look for Halloween films I have not seen yet. Like, Because I've seen a lot, especially for after last year when I was doing a lot of the first time yeah, watches. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll do my uh, honorable mentions. Uh, like Heather said, a bunch had been mentioned already, but uh, Night of the Demons, obviously, because I just fucking love that movie. Um, Trick or Treat 2007, because, yeah, I, I fucking love this movie as well, but I knew at least one of us for sure would have that one on our list. <laughs> Halloween almost made it to this honorable mention list because I had assumed someone would put it on the list, but I'm glad I brought it for the main list because no one did talk about it. Um, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Fuck yes. Uh, Adam's Family, 1991. Fun I, I watched, once again, it's not necessarily a Halloween-themed movie, but it just fits this time of year. And I remember going to theaters and seeing it and absolutely loving it. Uh, and then this one I watched last year and I for the first time, and I ended up watching the entire trilogy. But uh, Hell House LLC. just Yeah, great trilogy. Oh. Great trilogy. Oh my God, I love that freaking movie yeah. so much. It is so damn creepy. And I've already watched it three times since last year. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome, Scotty. Uh, and then, of course, Hocus Pocus from 1993, because it's another one I wouldn't seen in theaters when I was a kid. And to this day, still holds up. It has some, once again, creepy moments to it and awesome uh, zombie effects with Billy, played by a good old Doug Jones. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, and how about you, uh, Mike? What are your honorable mentions? 
All right. So I um, I have a few. First one, I'll well, the first two are pretty obvious. Uh, Halloween, the original. Hell yeah. Uh, the only reason it wasn't on my list was because when I was putting together my list, I know I remember asking Heather beforehand, like, are we omitting the Halloween franchise because it's just their obvious picks? She said no. So my initial thought was like, well, it's going to be on there somehow. But the, the only reason I didn't was because Halloween, the original, it's just kind of by default always on anyway in the month of October. Like, right. I don't really have to make an effort to be like, OK, I'm going to sit down and watch Halloween because it's Halloween. Like, I've already it's already been on my TV about four times this month because I work from home and AMC is well, doing like their fear fest. So it's like always on in the background in this month, no matter what, even if I'm not giving it 100 percent of my attention. So next one, I'm actually a big fan of the sequel, Halloween 2. Uh, yeah, I love the fact that it, yeah, I love the fact that it takes place immediately the same night, right after the events of the first one. I know it has the controversial like brother sister uh, element added to it. I've never had a problem with it. I understand why people are annoyed by it because it's it's not really necessary, but I think it makes sense in certain ways, which you know we can get into that another time when we break down the movie. But I'll just say I, I really like it. And my last one is uh, I don't know if this is a controversial pick or not, but House of a Thousand Corpses because a lot of people forget that Fuck it actually yeah. takes place on Halloween night. Like Fuck yeah, I, Mike. Uh, I trimmed oh, that yeah. one off my list. Like it was in my honorable mentions. I was like, all right, I have too many honorable mentions. I'll trim House of a Thousand Corpses off, but that's another one I watch around October every year. Yeah, and I know I would say the majority of people like Devil's Rejects better, and I understand why. And I'm not even going to argue that House of a Thousand Corpses is better even though i personally kind of like it better but to me it's like you take the characters from devil rejects well what are these crazy serial killers what would they do on halloween well that's yes. house of a thousand corpses and the fact that we actually get halloween happening in it i think that's an element that's overlooked because people don't really throw this one in on halloween movies lists but it is taking place on halloween um yeah, there's, a, there's a big Devil's halloween list. aesthetic going out mm -hmm. yeah that's so awesome. yeah i love yeah, the movies we brought to the table here can i just say that it was a variety of decades yes. too like we went all the way back to 1959 as recent as 2019 and everything in between like i think we gave people a variety of whatever your preference may be and really like honestly there's a bunch of halloween i didn't movies i didn't mention that we all love i'm sure you guys are the same like it's hard yeah. to find a halloween movie you don't like to be quite honest with you um i don't know maybe i won't like halloween kills seeing that soon who knows um <laughs> but i yeah this has been a lot of fun so thank you so much mike for joining oh man that was it was fun and the funny thing is with lists i'm always like like uh apprehensive because lists are so subjective even to yourself right like my list today, you could be like, come back in a month to do the same list over again. And I might have three of the five different, but yep, same. yeah, it's still fun. I almost see lists as like a time capsule. Like at this time, this is what my top whatever were. And if it changes in a year, so be it. And I'm Absolutely. Saying that's, and that's kind of why we love doing these like list shows for Patreon. Cause it's, we know everybody loves lists. Like it's just mm -hmm. something fun and it, you uh, end up finding something that, or you bring up some movies that people may not have seen before and you yeah, help maybe even some of the hosts haven't seen before. So it's just kind of neat to hear other people's opinions on what their favorites are and whatever topic we end up choosing for these top five. And I'm very happy that you got to join us for this because, yeah, this has uh, never been very fun and very surprising with like how I think we didn't have really any repeats for the most part until our honorable mentions. Yeah, and even then, like, of course, everyone's going to say Halloween 1978, right? Yeah. But like, I think we brought enough other varieties. But Mike, speaking of opinions, where can people hear more of your opinion? <laughs> Plug your stuff. Yeah, if you aren't tired of my opinions yet, then I... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the probably easiest way to find me is on Fresh Cuts. That's a weekly show where we cover new stuff, whether theatrical or VOD. Obviously, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the next big one that's coming out is uh, Halloween Kills. We'll be covering that this coming up month. Well, I guess depending on when this episode releases, it'll be. This will probably Monday. go to Patreon next week. So okay. it will. Your Fresh Cuts will be out before this is released. For exactly sure. Yeah. for sure. So yeah. 
if you want to hear me and my co-host talk about Halloween Kills, check that out on Dark Discussions. And then the main show is No More Room in Hell, as Heather said, where uh, that one is mainly, or mostly we just pick movies we feel like watching. We rotate who does the picks and then all kind of like your news, any, any topics in the horror genre people want to talk about. And then we just kind of get catch up on what we're watching because even with fresh cuts, we, we still have plenty of new movies we don't get to talk about on there. So we'll throw the ones we don't cover on Fresh Cuts on there. But those are the main things. And uh, yeah, that's it. Burning for Springwood, I think Scott already brought up. We talked Freddy's Nightmares. you got to be really uh, patient to want to hear people talk about <laughs> Freddy's Nightmares. I won't lie, but if that's your jam, check it out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for plugging your stuff and joining us as always. Uh, Scott, sorry, you were going to say something? I was going to say, yeah, Burning for Springwood's a lot of fun, like, because we were, we were lucky enough to join them for one of the episodes, and that was a lot of fun mm-hmm. going back and visiting some of those Freddy Nightmares episodes, for sure. Yeah. yeah, it was a good time. And you know that you can find Mike, I think, is, there, is that still on Legion, or no, is it uh, no longer on Legion? Uh, Burning for Springwood is Legion, I believe, because technically Gary is the, I, I don't even know what, but I, I He's a brainchild of Burning for Springwood, and I believe all of Gary's stuff is Legion, yes. It is. So you can find Mike on Legion. He's also been, I believe, some panels on Legion as well, too. And if you are listening to this early and you're a Legion Patreon, thank you so much for your support. Thank you. If you are listening to this on the weekend of Halloween, you could have been listening to this earlier if you were a Legion member. (laughs) If you pay $3 a month, you get access to not only Scott and I sharing our top five and a much better podcaster joining us on each episode, but you also get cinema psyops, cinema psyops special episodes. You get Bo's, Ramsel's Dark Parade episodes. You get lots of good stuff. So please join us if you haven't already. What are you waiting for? Join um, us. Join us. Yeah. And on one that, of us. One of <laughs> us. And on that note, Scotty, anything you need to add before we say goodbye? Um, just that I hope everyone has a wonderful and safe Halloween and enjoys the spooky season as it continues on. And until next time, kitties, unpleasant dreams. Bye. Have a pumpkin spice latte.